you know, they're, they're, they're to two totally different uh, approaches, and neither one's totally uh, displaces the other one. And I think the combination of EDTA plus uh, NBMI treatment of patients could be very effective. Because EDTA does, will not pull mercury out of the body. It won't pull it off of proteins that whether it's reacted with the thio. I mean, there's no doubt about that. My compound will take that mercury off very quickly. But my compound will do nothing about dissolving calcium deposits in the body. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just chemistry. And so we, we need to understand the chemistry the doctors do to do it, use it right. And uh, I think the combination of the two will be a, a boon to everybody. So, is that... Yes, uh, I want to ask, uh, um, do you think it's necessary to uh, uh, remove the amalgam fillings before taking the, uh, your product, Imanometro? You know, I, I really don't like answering that question mm -hmm. because I can tell you that the amount of mercury that comes off of an amalgam filling or several a day okay. yeah. would be picked up. If you, ha if you took my compound every day at, say, 200 milligrams per person, the, that mercury would never get deposited in your body. So it, it would eliminate the need to uh, uh, do it. And I would say, the, but I'm in favor of getting rid of all amalgam fillings. I mean, I really am. Mm -hmm. But I would think that the real use of this compound ought to be to treat people that are going to go have their amalgams removed, you know, before, before. take it before and take it after. For, well, because you have a big bolus of exposure yeah. to mercury at that time. But, uh, you know, a lot of people can't afford it. I mean, that's, I, they call me all the time. I yes. can't afford to have my four amalgams out. That's $6,000, and I don't have that kind of money. Would your compound protect me? Yes, it will. I mean, I, I can calculate how much. If you take 200 milligrams or 300, whatever amount you take a day, I can calculate because 80% roughly is absorbed. And if you look at the body burden, you can even measure it. You can calculate how many molecules of... NBMI you would have floating around per ml of blood. And not only that, if you take it on a regular basis, it collects in your uh, hydrophobic aspects of the arteries, I mean, and the, where the blood flows, and it has a 22-hour plasma half-life. So it stays there, binding to the hydrophobic regions of the proteins in the blood, as well as in the walls of the uh, arteries. So the conclusion is that of course, you recommend to, that it is removed before, but uh, it, it's not compromised by amalgam fillings uh, being there. Well, no, it, it's, it's compromised. When we took mercury toxic rats, we had rats that we knew the mercury level in their blood. Yeah. And we gave them NBMI, and then we measured the NBMI in their blood. And what happened? In the mercury toxic rats, the level of NBMI we found in the plasma dropped just about commensurately with it reacting with the mercury. Because when it binds mercury, it's no longer NBMI. It's NBMI mercury complex, totally different properties, totally insoluble in anything. And so, you no, know, the mercury, uh, you would lose that part. Two things destroy the effectiveness of NBMI. Uh, if you have mercury in the body, you eliminate the NBMI out as an antioxidant. If you have a lot of oxidative stress, then you're scavenging hydroxy-free radicals, then you eliminate the ability of NVMI to bind mercury. If you think about it, it makes sense. Yeah. I know you can't answer, but it's uh, the, uh, the second uh, question uh, related. The same uh, uh, option uh, about, but in relation to uh, uh, EDTA uh, chelation, should it always uh, be uh, um, being uh, removed uh, amalgam uh, fillings before EDTA treatment? Is anybody being able to answer this? You can do the uh, EDTA uh, chelation, although you have amalgam fillings, but the IAOMT uh, says that they can't, uh, it's not acceptable. In my opinion, it's not acceptable. We make one provocation test and use EDTA and DMPS, although there might be amalgam fillings in the patient in the teeth. <coughs> but it's not, in my opinion, it's not acceptable because we know that uh, 
that the, the, the treatment of ADTA makes makes mercury much more toxic when when you don't take a sulfur efficient uh, substance like DMPS. And um, in my opinion, it's not uh, okay to treat patients with chelation long term um, to let the amalgam fillings in. We have a new approach <laughs> um, with Boyd Haley. Okay, it's it's new for me. It's uh, I will try to get this stuff and we'll we'll test it in my practice. But um, in the normal uh, concepts we have without emeramide. It's not possible, and I, even with this concept, it's it's not consequent. I think we have to be consequent, and uh, you can't uh, you can't uh, let it uh, all the principles out because we might have a new substance. And um, I think we should uh, take out all the inflammation, the silent and chronic inflammation in the teeth, in the jaw, all the things, and uh, the, the amalgam filling belong to. A consequence taking it out belong belong to a consequence uh, therapy concept. But I have a question to you, yeah. if it's okay, yeah. it's it's enough for you. Um, w wouldn't it be the consequence of taking emeramide um, that we can't measure if the emeramide builds metal emeramide and, and NMBI and metal complexes, non-soluble -solu complexes, that we won't measure again or when we make a provocation test with the MPS and ADTA, that we would have decreased values? Wouldn't it be the consequence? What, what do you think about it? Yeah, that's what we've done with the rats. I'll tell you some of the studies done with rats and you can tell me if you think it, it fits. If you take rats and you treat them with emeramide, and then give them mercury. And you have a, the one where you don't treat with the merimed, you gave mercury to. And then you give DMPS. The DMPS has no effect on the rat that's got a merimed. I mean, there'll still be no, there'll be no increase in urinary mercury at all. As a matter of fact, urinary mercury will be below the control levels. But if you, because it, it's binding, it doesn't go out through the kidney at all. It's a totally inert complex, no charge, and kidney moves things that are based on charges usually. But, and, and uh, uh, if we do, but what we see is a shift. If we take rats and give them NBMI and, uh, or DMPS, what we see is a shift. If you give, it to, give them DMPS, you see a huge amount in the urine. I mean, it's just, I mean, we're talking huge amounts. And if you, ha if you had given them NBMI before, there's none. I mean, it doesn't go up, hardly gets it above baseline. But if you look at the fecal amount, it's just the opposite. If you give NBMI, the fecal level goes up about tenfold, and uh, with NBMI, with DMPS alone, it doesn't go up very much at all. Because the NMBI binds yeah. in the but, GI but, tract, and we're using on this, the mercury. Yeah, we're using this as an argument. The way you uh, see the effectiveness of NBMI for binding mercury is that you uh, you do a pre MRMI uh, treatment. You do a DMPS challenge test. You'll see a big bunch of mercury. And then you give them NBMI for a number of days, however you want, and test it whenever, whatever you're trying to do, and you'll, you won't see an increase. Because NBMI binds the mercury and renders it totally non-reactive. That's how it stops the toxicity. That's a proof. That's great. Pardon? That's a proof of, of the concept. Yeah. It's, it's, but, the, it's but the, you know, the, I want to tell you, the FDA hates the mercury challenge test so much that it's hard to get them to even consider it. But we're going to do it anyway. We're doing it on a group of uh, mercury toxic children in the, or youths, they're not children anymore, they're 17, 18 years old. Uh, we're going to do exactly what I just told you. Because you have, to shove, you have to do the results and shove it down their throats. I mean, basically that's it. Does it mainly bind mercury? No, it bind, no uh, actually it, uh, it is very good at binding free iron. Mm. If we take a, a healthy rat and give him all high amounts, I mean 1,000 milligrams a day for 28 days, we don't see any decrease in the iron, in the tissues, in the hemoglobin, anywhere. But if you take a rat that's a, a model for uh, hemochromatosis, this rat will build up mercury in its body and it becomes demented. It loses the functionality of its limbs, lays down and it dies. If you give it NBMI, that doesn't happen. You save it. 
And so then you can sacrifice those rats at different times and analyze their body for free iron and for iron above the, you know, the normal level. And NBMI brings it down near uh, control levels. But there's no toxicity, and it binds iron. And in a, in a test tube, it binds iron uh, totally uh, irreversibly. I mean, we say uh, thermodynamically irreversibly because you can't measure an off rate. In other words, if we take iron and add NBMI to it and precipitate all the iron down into an iron NBMI complex, we can add 10 millimolar EDTA and it won't dissolve it. It won't take off any iron. I mean, you can you know, vortex it, spin it up, heat it, do everything you want, and then you can pull off that liquid and see is there any iron in it. There's none in it. You never dissolve it. I mean, that complex is incredibly uh, stable. Okay, my last question. <laughs> Um, yesterday you told us about um, excreting by whatever procedure the <coughs> complexes. How right. will it work? How can it work? All okay. of the cell? Or the it, it works the standard way that, uh, you know, when, when people give hydrophobic drugs and they want to keep them around for a long time, they try to do something to inhibit the oxidation and the, the excretion of the drug by the P450 detox system. The P450 detox system gets rid of any hydrophobic toxic molecule like benzene. The way you get rid of benzene, benzene will never leave your body if you didn't have a P450 system. But benzene, everybody knows what benzene looks like. The way you get rid of it, you oxidize it. In the first stage one of the P450 system, you make benzene with a hydroxyl group on it. And then the phase two part of it, there are enzymes that come in and attach sulfate, or uh, uh, ubiquinate it, uh, or uh, GST, glutathione as transferase. You put a glutathione on it. So what you're doing is you're adding a charge to an uncharged molecule. And when you make the benzene sulfate, it's water-soluble, and you urinate it out. When you go with the NBMI, and we've done the study showing that it gets oxidized on that benzene ring, that's kind of the reason I liked having it in there, because it gave a way of getting rid of an inert complex. I mean, if you make mercury sulfide, or pardon me, selenium sulfide, or selenium, pardon me, selenium mercury, how do you get rid of it? 